Hello, and thank you for joining us for the 52nd episode of That Show with Billy Wilson. The show brings together artists, musicians, photographers, personalities, and all sorts of fun and interesting people from around the world each Friday for a hangout. Tonight, we have a diverse panel of guests, including the CEO of Girlfriend Social, Amanda Blaine, who I believe is in Hi. Miami. Hi, I'm in Miami. Yeah, and we have photographer and humanitarian Annette Biggers. Hi. Maybe showing us some more of her photos. And we have photographer Jordan Norum who's always drinking from his tea horn. Yes, yeah, it's there, there it is, the tea horn. And we have Canadian top recording artist. Oh, God, the cat just bit my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have Canadian top recording recording artist, Marika Seiwert, right? Or Seiwert, right? Seiwert. Okay. I was trying to find how to say your name before like, we're about to do the hangout, so I was like looking up all the videos of you singing and all that. But it, it, like, I could only get your first name. But, and we also have... YouTube technology reviewer Marcus Brownlee, who does some really great YouTube videos there about like different uh, new technologies and stuff. He has uh, you, you do like cell phone reviews and all that kind of stuff. Like I'm not a tech guy, but you have the good videos up there. So if you're into technology, I greatly encourage you to check out his YouTube channel. It's uh, MKBHD. Yep. That's it. Yes. And we have Miss World Canada, Tara Tang, who is a vo voice for children around the world in rescuing them from sex slavery. Yes. And Hi, everyone. We also have actor and photojournalist Zach Coomer. Is that how you pronounce your last yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Good. Good. Great to be here. Timmy bit my hand twice during this introduction because he, he demands that I pet him all the time. But you know, as I'm doing like the introduction, I'm not paying attention to how I'm petting him. And apparently I touched his chest or something. He doesn't like his chest touch. So he bit me. But anyway, here's the cat. Come that on, Tibby. Happen. Do you want to be seen? Come on, come on, come on, Tibby. Every, half the people watching this want to just see Tibby, I swear. Don't I pass Tibby in the mouth. Uh, here we go. Here, here's our 21-pound Tabby of the show. The co-host, Mr. Tibby. Wow. That's a big cat. It's a tiger. <laughs> it's a big cat. That's a big what man. he said right now. There he is. And so is that that's not in. the chest? Is that you? You call that the lower chest? Is that upper belly? What? How would you define that region, Billy? Which region? Like it this depends no on, on his position on the floor. Like, whoa! He just grabbed my nose. But if he's on the floor and he touch here, he hits that. Um, and typically, he doesn't like his belly touched. Ooh, like right now. So yeah, I'm gonna release the chest now. <laughs> I'm glad I think he wants it. To release. That's that's important. Yeah. <laughs> uh, come on, Tibet. And now we should jump into our show. One of the main topics during this show that we want to talk about is uh, the issue of of child slavery in the world today and how it's still going on. And I believe you, Tara Tang, uh, are, are a voice for uh, children and, and that. And uh, we'd like to hear a bit more about like what you do and stuff like that. We begin. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, a little background to who I am and what I do, in case anyone um, isn't familiar with that, is uh, I, I'm a professional public speaker, and I work full-time the last number of years to combat human trafficking, violence against women, and child exploitation. So I'm essentially the bridge between my partner organizations that I work with. Sometimes they're governmental organizations, sometimes they're NGOs and charity groups, other times they're victim services or law enforcement. And I'm the bridge between what's actually going on in the field into what's educating the general public into what's going on and how they can be involved in and how we can be part of effective solutions. Awareness is huge and if we can raise an awareness then we can also move forward into engagement and hopefully into action so that we can actually think, see things effectively change. So a little bit about kind of how I got to where I am today is um, I moved into a new community which is a suburb of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada and I had heard about human trafficking, I had heard about child exploitation, but I always thought it was something that happened in developing nations. And then I moved into my community and I got to know my neighbors and I found out that one of my neighbors had lost a daughter. Their daughter had been trafficked from our community at 14 years old and she had been lured into sex trafficking into forced prostitution by a trafficker who posed as a boyfriend. And she's never been seen since. For about two decades she's been missing now. So, you know, you hear people say that these kind of things happen in your own backyard, they happen in your city, they happen in your community, but it literally was in my own backyard, just doors down from where I lived, people that I knew and loved and cared about. 
And that kind of was the spark that propelled me into the work that I do now today. Um, I've been all over the world. I've worked mostly in Southeast Asia as well as all throughout Canada. And um, I look at the topic of human trafficking. You know, currently in around the world, there are actually more slaves today in 2013 than ever before in human history. There are an estimated 27 million people that are caught in modern day slavery and 50% of that are children. About 80% of that are females and the average age of a human trafficking victim or also known as a child, uh, also known as a modern day slave is about 12 years old in the world today. So um, you know, I spend most of my time, or a lot of my time, in slum villages, in red light districts, in brothels, and um, I, I work with victim services and try to find ways, try to find solutions of how we can actually bring systemic effective change to these situations. Mm. Those, those are crazy stats. Did you say 27 million? Yeah, currently there are an estimated 27 million, and that's actually an outdated stat that was done in uh, 2007 when human trafficking was the third largest uh, criminal activity on the world today. It's now actually the second largest. Oh no! Human trafficking, the sale of moder of people in modern day slavery, makes more every year than Google, Nike, and Starbucks combined. So it's second only to the drug trade. In the next five to ten years, it's expected that the sale internationally of people is actually expected to surpass the sale of drugs worldwide. So it's a huge, huge issue and uh, there, there are documented cases of human trafficking in 161 countries worldwide including Canada, including the United States, countries that we might think don't have this problem. Um, and human trafficking takes a variety of different forms. It can look like forced labor trafficking, um, think trafficking and slavery in, in the cocoa industry is huge um, and timely for us to be talking about since we have Easter just coming up around the corner. Um, it's a huge thing in the coffee industry. It's a huge thing in, in the textile industry. Um, we, you know, other forms of human trafficking is sex trafficking. That's huge. That's probably the area that I work with most is sex trafficking. Also, you know, one of those things that, um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with when we talk about sex trafficking is Taken. Um, it was a huge movie that brought a lot of awareness and did show, you know, a few of the scenes were were really very realistic where other ones were, you know, Hollywoodized. But that whole process of recruiting, that whole process of um, then these human beings that are daughters, that are sisters, that are friends, um, being sold and essentially raped for a profit, you know, that's what I deal with. So, so what? Go ahead, Jordan. Uh, I was wondering what, um, like looking at, at trying to bring about systemic change and, and raise awareness, what what uh, tactics, I mean it's such a huge issue and it seems so traumatic and crazy, how how can people hope to change that or what what methods do you have for trying to change that? Well, understanding what human trafficking is and, and some of the reasons why this even takes place. You know, it, in a lot of the developing nations that I work with, extreme poverty is, is a huge thing. We don't have to tell anybody that we live in a day and age where there, we have a huge gap between those who are the haves and those who are the have-nots. I have personally worked with families that cannot feed their children and so in order to survive they might have four children and they send one off and they sell her to a brothel and the money that they get from that then provides for the other three children at home. You know that's that kind of absolutely overwhelming oppressive um, desperate poverty that some people live in in the world today where pa parents are selling their children. Um, it doesn't make it a choice. <laughs> it's, it's lack of option. Um, so that's one of the things, you know, if, when we're looking at ending human trafficking, we're also looking at breaking the cycle of poverty and that's one of the solutions that we have to actually look at traffic proofing these communities and traffic proofing these villages. Because a lot of tactics that um, traffickers will use. You know, when I when I'm working in Southeast Asia, I, I find a lot of women um, who are actually from Eastern Europe, and they've been trafficked to Southeast Asia, or they've been trafficked to Vancouver, Canada. And these are women who, um, you know, with the fall of communism, there's a lot of economic instability in Eastern Europe. They are having a hard time um, 
looking for work or maybe they were orphaned or abandoned or put into foster care and now they're out looking for a job and they answer a job saying that you know they can work as a nanny they can work at a hotel they can work in a restaurant something like that so they accept these job offers but they don't have money to pay for the plane ticket they don't have money to pay for the visas so they make a deal with the agents that says when they arrive they'll accept the job and then they will pay back the debt that they owe but then they find themselves landing in Canada or they find themselves somewhere else in the world. You know, I worked with this one girl. Um, we met this one girl in Thailand and she was originally from Moldova. Um, and she had accepted a job to work at a restaurant in Moscow. But she finds herself in Turkey, not in Moscow. And then she basically, I'll save you all the details, but she essentially spent three months in Turkey, which is known internationally as the breaking in grounds. There she was essentially went through so much torture and abuse that she will never walk away and she will never say no. And then from that experience, when we met her in Thailand, she had been there and she was working in a brothel and she had been there only for five days, starting to pay back the debt that she owed, trying to get a job that she was lied to, that she was manipulated, that was fraudulent. Um, trying to just make a, a sustainable living for herself. So one of the things that we really do is, um, you know, try to dispel these myths that traffickers use. We try to get there first so that we can educate people who are vulnerable and who are at risk, educate them with what's going on so that they can then know and be aware and be able to protect themselves, you know, so that they can know to spot warning signs of, of things that traffickers use, tactics and strategies that traffickers use to recruit so that they can be aware so that they hopefully don't fall into the same situation. We also try to let them know what the um, victim services hotlines are, you know, so that they know how to get help. And a lot of the struggles, because we're living in, in a world now where globalization has happened, it's so much easier to cross international borders. It just takes a few hours to be on the other side of the world now. You know, it's very easy for, for traffickers to transport their victims. And you all of a sudden have somebody who doesn't speak the language, doesn't know the culture, doesn't know the community and it's very easy to control them in that kind of setting because they have no knowledge of what's going on they don't know who that they can talk to they don't know what services are available to them um, and they're they're afraid they're they have threats of violence on them on a daily basis and it's controlling them you know so trying to to get the word out of what's going on into these very vulnerable communities so we can actually prevent it from happening in the first place so that we can start to traffic proof communities let people know what's going on so that they can be aware and they can be protected and they can be safe so things like that um, also ed one thing that um, the group that I work with is really big on is educating people within the community we wrote um, North America's first ever municipal action plan to combat human trafficking at a local level so that's been adopted by my community and uh, there are a couple other communities throughout Canada that are, have put it before their city councils as well. So hopefully those will also be adopted. And it's really focused on education. It's focused on education and awareness and letting people know about the resources that are out there. So in those kinds of situations, we're educating uh, first aid responders. We're educating um, teachers in the classrooms and the school board trustees, people who will actually have um, direct contact with victims or potential victims so that we can hopefully spot victims so we can get them the proper services and we can intervene when necessary so that people's lives are actually protected. That's something that we deal with a lot on a local level. Then there's also on an international level, you know, when we're talking about breaking the cycle of poverty, education is huge. You know, we know we've all heard how important education is, especially for young children, especially for young girl children. So things like that, if we can break the cycle of poverty through education and other tools like that, that actually give people open doors of opportunities, they're less likely for somebody to come in to promise, you know, the American dream, all this grandeur, you're going to have a great life, it's going to be good, just, you know, entrust your 12-year-old child to me and I'll make sure that they get a good job in the city where they can send money back home to you in your poor village. You know, things like that. If we can actually equip people that we are empowering them so that they don't fall prey into, you know, this coercion, this manipulation, this violence, you know, the the lures of of everything that the traffickers have to offer. That's a really big strategy as well too. And then another one that we've really been strongly pushing is looking at the topic of demand. 
you know, human trafficking is a supply and demand industry, just like every other industry on the planet. Starbucks is is successful because people are demanding they want they want to buy Starbucks coffee, so they Starbucks will be in business as long as people are wanting to buy Starbucks coffee. Human trafficking works the same way. You know, people want cheap products, they want to not spend a lot of money on their t shirts. So that means that somebody somewhere down along the supply chain is unfortunately being exploited and taken advantage of situations like that. You know, I'll go back to the topic of of chocolate because this is Easter weekend and there's a lot of chocolate hopping around these days, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we're looking at chocolate slavery, for example, something that you guys might not know is that seventy to eighty percent of the world's cocoa is grown in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. Now the Ivory Coast is known to have 90% of their plantations use child slave labor. This was discovered by CNN, BBC, and a number of other news, um, uh, news teams have partnered with organizations working in the area to actually reveal what's going on. Um, you can look at CNN, the Freedom Project, if you want to do a little more research into that for yourself. It's a very good, um, very good news series. But basically what that means is that you and I as consumers, if we're not looking at fair trade chocolate, if we're not looking at slave free chocolate, there's a really mm -hmm. good chance that the cocoa in that chocolate bar was made by a child that doesn't even know what chocolate looks or tastes like. And for me, as someone who wants to try to live justly, I want to make sure that the money that I have, that I'm responsible for, and the choices that I make on a daily basis, that somebody isn't suffering based on the choices that I have as a consumer with the money and with the power. I want to make sure that when I'm spending my money, I'm not hurting someone. I'm actually empowering someone. And so that's why I really encourage people to think about the choices that they make as consumers on a daily basis, because whether we think we're, we're affecting human trafficking or not, we're off, we often are because we're part of the demand for these products that are often part of the supply chain. And a resource that I give a lot of people is this great resource, it's called Free, the number two, Work. And that's something that you can look up on the website, freetowork.org, or if you have one of these handy little iPhones, Androids, you can look up the free app called Free to Work. And it's got a barcode scanner in it, and essentially what you can do as a consumer is you can go, when you go shopping, you can scan a barcode, and right away it will come up with that company's ethical rating from A to F. So you don't have to go and you don't have to do all the research. We don't have all, all have the time to sit at home and do all the research ourselves. Someone has already done it for us. And right away, you know, we as consumers can see who is making ethical choices, and we can put our money to actually reward those companies that say, hey, you're, you're making good ethical choices for people. You don't have slavery in the supply chain. I'm going to buy your product over this other product that could potentially be hurting somebody. So there are resources out there like that. And I think, you know, I have, I have faith in, in most of the people that I've met. I've met a lot of amazing people around the world that actually want to live justly, that they want to be empowering people's lives. And if they just knew the resources out there, you know, no one wants to be responsible for someone's suffering. So if we just knew what was going on, a lot of us probably would make more just choices with the consum as consumers that we have. And that, if we're doing things that way, we're looking at the demand on a labor trafficking side we can see things like child slave labor, you know, in the chocolate industry and, and the coffee industry and other industries like that. We can actually see that start to go down because we're directly responsible. You know, and another way when we're looking at sex trafficking, for example, again, it's a supply and demand thing. So, and, you know, I've looked into a lot of the research and obviously prostitution is a really touchy subject. But in a lot of countries um, that have been surveyed, about 92 to 98 percent of individuals who are currently in the sex trade are not actually there by choice. They're either there because they themselves have been sex trafficked, they've been forced by traffickers, pimps and recruiters, or they're there for lack of options because you know they have to provide for their family. Say it's Thailand and they, ha they have to provide for their family. They're not educated. Um, they don't have other job skills because they never got job skill training. You know, and because the average entry age in a lot of countries, in Canada the average entry age into prostitution is between 12 and 14 years old, often and, and not uncommonly, it's even as young as 11. These are people who haven't finished their, their high school. <laughs> you know, they haven't finished their education. I'm talking about in Canada, 
not let alone looking at prostitution in somewhere like Thailand or Cambodia or India or something like that. You know, so they don't have a lot of options. And, and I personally don't see lack of option as a choice. I don't deny ever that there are individuals who are working in prostitution that do have a choice, but I'm talking about the ones who don't have a choice, where it's forced prostitution, where it's sex trafficking, and quite frankly, it's rape for a profit. You know, so in that kind of top sense too, um, we're really talking about, you know, how do we curb the demand? We 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 lower the buyer rate, because if we lower the buyer rate, you lower the supply rate, and less people are going to be trafficked in what I think is one of the most horrific ways to be raped for a profit. You know, so I I know I put a lot of that out there to answer your question, but you know, those are some of the ways that we we are seeing things change, and and yes, I do see some of the most horrific things that humanity can do to one another. You know, I've worked with children that before their 10th birthday, they've been raped for a profit over 70,000 times. You know, like, it's just absolutely horrific sometimes. Sometimes these poor children, you know, have been locked in a back room of a brothel, haven't seen the daylight for, t for two years. I've worked with a couple cases where that's been the case. You know, and they've, they've seen clients you know, 20 times a day, these poor kids, when they should be in school, where they should be protected, where they should be safe, they should have the care of a family, they should be able to play with friends. You know, I do see some of the worst things. But I also have the incredible privilege of seeing victims become survivor. I do see the incredible privilege of seeing lives be restored, of seeing these, these, these children who thought that they had no value and no dignity and no worth or, or adults, adults are trafficked too. But see these individuals who are told that they were worthless, they're only worth what they can make, the money that they can make for someone else's profit. See them start to dream again. And see them become strong, empowered, intelligent, integral leaders in their community that are confronting what's wrong in the world and multiplying what is right. That they're actually starting to be part of seeing the world change. And that is so inspiring to me. Yes, I see horrible things, but I also get to see, witness some of the best things that humanity is capable of. And, and so I hope that at the end of this, you guys don't walk away thinking like, oh my goodness, I live in a horrible world. <laughs> like, yes, it's not perfect, but there are such good things that are happening. And so my invitation to all of you on the panel and to everybody out there who is listening is to get involved because things are changing. You know, I, I find so much inspiration looking at you know, leaders in the past like William Wilberforce, like Martin Luther King Jr., um, Rosa Parks, and, and these heroes, you know, that saw something that was wrong in the world and they didn't stand for it, that they chose to actually be part of the solution and they didn't back down. Even though it was hard, they saw the people's lives change and we saw history change as a result. And I think that we're living in that time now where we could, I, I, I really believe, we can see modern day slavery come to an end we're going to see human trafficking start to decrease. And I want to be part of that. And I want okay. you guys to be Look, part wait, of that. Those, those stats that you gave in the beginning, are they going up or are they going down? Currently, it is going up because okay. we are seeing, um, you know, demanding, demand is increasing. And... We are seeing we are seeing things change. We're a little bit as with any kind of issue, we're often kind of late in the game, you know? You kind of feel like you're running to catch up. But there is great collaboration happening among NGOs, among government agencies, among victim services and law enforcement. Things are changing. Um, okay. We're also seeing a lot of now that there's a lot more victim services that are out there, you're seeing a lot of victims themselves actually step up and be leaders. They right. know what to look for. They know where to go. Things like that, you know. And um, you think one of the best things that all of us can do as a person, like you said, it was really simple, download some of these apps, start yeah, making I mean, better conscious decisions. One. Absolutely. Cool. I mean, that's step one. When we're looking cool. at, at labor trafficking, it is a supply and demand issue, just like every other form of trafficking really you know so we can actually lower the demand and, and recently to, to kind of answer your question um, and I'll just kind of end with this because it's a nice high note but um, H&M for example big huge mega company around the world right recently they because of the the, the shift through the free-to-work app 
and um, the Free to Work website, they have released the whole information about their supply chains and they have totally made it much more ethical. So their, their ethical ranking according to Free to Work just moved up to a B, which is great. You know, so things like that, because there's a shift with consumers where they're demanding more justly ethical made, ethically made products, it's actually affecting people's lives who are working within the supply chain, and we're seeing the big corporations actually take note. So things are changing, and it is affecting people's lives. You know, well, sometimes it takes yeah. a long time, but things are changing, and it's really positive, so. And that's great to know that they're, they're changing and getting better. I also wanted to hear a bit about uh, you, Marcus, and, and your YouTube channel and, and the videos that you make. Like, they're, they're really good, like, uh, and uh, videography is one of the things I've been wanting to get into a bit more, and uh, I, I noticed that you also were talking about, like, uh, I, was, I watched a couple of your videos, and you, told, and you mentioned, like, how you started with a uh, Rebel T3i for your, like, first digital SLR camera for, like, Filming and that kind of stuff, and a lot of the uh, audience who that are actually watching are also into cameras. So, if you have like anything uh, on, on cameras, you could also talk about that. But yeah, be good yeah. To, like I think you've also been doing your channel for quite a few years too. I look back, like it's been like five years that you've been running it. Yeah, yeah. So I started actually in two thousand, the beginning of two thousand nine, which wasn't really anything close to what I'm doing now, um, but. The first videos I did were all software-based, so I would do what's called screen capture, screen recording, or screencasts, which is where I just use software to record what was on my screen, and I do sort of tutorials that would teach people about software and give instructional sort of videos and that type of thing. Uh, and that was about two years and probably more than 200 videos. And then I moved to hardware-based stuff when I decided to, you know, show teach people how to do things that involved hardware. So I needed a camera to do uh, things like that. Uh, so yeah, like uh, the first, I guess, camera that I used that wasn't, you know, screencasting software was just like this little Olympus uh, pen digital camera. It wasn't all that great, but it got the job done. I kind of faked HD with it. So <laughs> it, it shot in like 640 by 480, but I would kind of stretch it and make it 720p. So it became a thing that I like pixels and I like uh, high definition video, but the Canon T2i was the first camera that I got that really let me uh, explore more with manual control and and video and stuff like that. So again, the videos I do now, even though they're not, um, even though they're not software instructional videos, they're still uh, I guess what I aim to be helpful videos for people uh, as they're watching. And I guess so now I use the Canon 5D Mark III, and I'm still learning every day about the software that I use to edit with. So I use Adobe Premiere now and Adobe After Effects, and there's a world of stuff I've never even touched. But uh, every day I'm learning stuff just from watching tutorials on YouTube and figuring out neat things you can do with video to help illustrate things better. And that's one of the, the big things. It's, it's that there's always the, the ability to learn, to find answers, to hit, discover and investigate new technology, new software, new hardware, because we're in this world that's always changing. So to hold on to one thing too long to not have the ability to move or grow or stretch is just not really an option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of people a lot of people say they, you know, they subscribe to a YouTube channel that sort of shifts too far from what they started off liking, so they unsubscribe, they don't like it anymore. But I think an evolution is important to you can't really stay as the same you, you end up making the same video over and over again at a certain point. So you kinda have to branch out and explore different things and that's I think what I've done at a certain certain road I've taken for that. Um, I have a question. How often or how much time do you spend in an average week doing editing on your videos? Roughly? Uh, just editing? Uh, I make about two videos a week, so I would say probably eight to twelve hours of editing. For I'd say four to six hours per video for editing. I mean there's a whole process before and after editing that takes a lot of time too, but just editing is I mean, it depends on the video. Sometimes there's like a, a two-hour edit that's a relatively simple video. The video I put up today took, I guess, six hours to completely edit, so. And you've been making videos since 2009, you said, so you started in 2009? Yeah, my first video was up, well, my first tech video was January 1st, 2009, so it's easy to remember. Yeah, and so that's saying, so within with five years of experience uh, making videos, doing that, adding bits and pieces as you learn to go, you're now, your workflow or your speed honed to the ability and level you're at now still requires 
uh, that many hours of, of work post, like outside of the filming and, and all the other stuff. Yeah. That's, uh, is that daunting? <laughs> what, what, could, what could help that make faster? Yes, I mean, sometimes I'll be editing a video that should have only taken maybe three or four hours, and then I'll, I'll want to do a certain specific thing. And then I'll, you know, visit Vimeo or YouTube and just go down this wormhole of tutorials and things that I want to try to do. And it'll take me eight hours to make a short video, but I'll learn a lot of things in the process that I can bring to other projects. That's I like I, that question because people are always like, oh, I'm going to become a YouTube star and it's going to be, you know, I'll just do it in passive time on the weekend. It'll take me like 20 minutes and the checks will just start. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is like a job. You have to treat it like a job. Yeah. It's good, Amanda. And I, and I, I think oh, that I like the point about the finding um, how, how you're going to go and you're, you're reading about something and then you're looking at one thing and it leads you to another thing and to another thing and you're picking up all these skills in all of these places that uh, were it wasn't what you were initially looking for or initially going for, but it all becomes a part of what you need to do to keep growing. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that knowledge can be implemented in, in, the, in future videos or the current video, you know. So it's it's all helpful. Yeah. Right. Did you did you actually purchase a, a Pixel Marquis? Uh yes, I did. I bought. Yeah. I pre I ordered it the day that it was announced. Like a complete fool that I am, but I don't regret it. <laughs> you don't. Do you do your video editing on the Pixel now? No, I. That's the one thing I haven't been able to find as a replacement for a video editor on Chrome OS. But everything I do. On YouTube, I do on whatever desktop machine I use. So right now, that's the Hackintosh Pro project that I put together a few months ago. Uh, but the mm -hmm. Pixel has been surprisingly effective. I mean, I use it to take notes. So I go to class and take notes in Google Docs. And it's kind of a it's a well-rounded machine, except for the operating system. So I can't edit videos on it. Yeah, yeah. I I uh, I use a couple. I have a Pixel, and I use a couple different um, video editing apps. They're pretty good. Um, Funny. Stuflix, have you heard of Stuflix? Uh, it doesn't ring a bell, no. Pixorial? I heard, I've heard that name. Okay, but I used yeah, it. check that out. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hmm. And Annette, I, I believe that you had some photos you want to share with us as well? Sure, um, I'll share uh, some of my favorites, and they just happen to be of two of our guests tonight, <laughs> Marika and Tara. So I'll just share those. I thought, I mean, I only want to show a few because we don't have a lot of time. So um, let me see if I can get them up here really fast. Um, here we go. Start. Wow, hottie. <laughs> I don't see it. Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we see it. We see it. It's all good. And that makes me look really good. <laughs> no, that's Marika, man. She is, like, really hot, huh? Okay. Now... <laughs> The next one coming up. Here she is again. Can you see it, you guys? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's another one of Marika. She, that was one of her. Uh, oh, I like that one. And then another one. Yet another one. She's like mm -hmm. so gorgeous. Ah, oh, Marika, Here's. that red dress. If you only knew what it took to get that red dress for her. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> the memories, the nest. <laughs> yeah, I know. And yes, those planes, that red plane back there. It's just such a miracle that it was red. Yeah. Um, and then uh, here's Tara, uh, a photo shoot we did last year before she took off to Miss World Canada. And we were just really just kind of, um, you know, making a pictorial shoot of who she is and what she does. And so we got some kids to uh, pose for us. And then we did some other kinds of things in front of uh, Vancouver, the city, with some of her gowns. And then here's one of, uh, we went to Chinatown, and this is actually Marika's little girl right here and her father. And we were just um, depicting, you know, her rescuing a, a little girl from sex trafficking. I remember seeing that picture. That's it was a very powerful grabbing. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. really striking. Wow, I like that. And then here she is, um, during the photo shoot, uh, we were walking uh, in Gastown, and there's this guy uh, sitting there. Um, Alan, what's his name? Uh, Alan. <laughs> and Tara became his new best friend, and it was really, really sweet. I 
that was one of my favorite photo shoots ever. Um, I have to say that, um, how do I turn that, okay, I did. Um, those two girls, Tara and Rika, um, they were my favorite photo shoots ever. I love getting on a plane and going up to Western Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everybody on here is from Canada. I think I'm really like, oh. <laughs> It was okay. one of my favorite, favorite times um, to photograph those two. Um, they're just, they are superstars in my opinion. And um, I told Tara before this, but I talked to her for two minutes on the phone and I was like, I am up there. I'm doing this photo <laughs> shoot. <laughs> I fell in love with her. Like two minutes on the phone. So there you go. There's my two minutes. <laughs> you did very well. That was. <laughs> <laughs> Annette's photos are just amazing. She, she does what no one else I've ever seen. I work with a lot of photographers, but Annette, yeah. you know, she's become such a dear friend to both Marika and I, but really, like, her artistry, her work is really just phenomenal. Like, there, I don't, I don't know a lot of other, um, you know, a lot of photographers kind of start to look the same, but for her, she really has this way of capturing the essence of the individual. Yeah. And and telling these amazing stories where, um, you know, you see courage and you see um, joy and you just you, it's just there's so much said in this tiny little image and it's it's really amazing. Yeah, I really think that that's the um, the most important thing for a photographer is to tell a story. I'm pretty sure most photographers feel that way, but mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that sets the really great photographers um, apart is that their story is impactful and it's uh, they're um, touching people's lives you know and they're making a mark um, on people's lives that that view them um, they're they're creating stories anyways I think too I just I want to say one more thing so I don't know if anyone knows this about Annette but I think the coolest thing for me and it's just like Tara I work with a lot of photographers and Annette really has the ability to to, to captivate life within the people. And I know that in my industry and in the fashion industry, um, oftentimes the artists or the clients or the models are just objects. And mm -hmm. there's, I, I'm not, I, I mean, those pictures look amazing. I'm not a naturally easy person to photograph, <laughs> I, I think. Um, but Annette basically brings the best out of whatever, of whoever she is shooting. And I think that's what is so captivating about her. And, you know, a, a, a while ago, uh, she took a whole team over to Africa. She has an organization called Heart for Africa. And they did, a, like, a 10-page spread um, on, you know, these orphans. And, like, I don't know any other photographers that do, that do that, start their own organizations and change the world with their photography. And so, yeah, I think it's what makes Annette Annette and why we love her. I and, and, and Zach, I believe that you uh, had a movie you wanted to talk about that you were in. Yeah, yeah, I, I just uh, completed this movie, Ice Cream. It's based on a successful uh, Italian short film that kind of went around the global circuit and won some great awards. And so they made an American um, feature-length film from it. And I, the whole film, it's pretty timely. It's about bullying. And um, I played the main bully, um, <laughs> Alex. And it's a psychological thriller, you know, there's, there's huge twists in the film, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and uh, I think it's just going to be a really timely, right. impactful movie for what's going on right now. And, cool. you know, so yeah. It's funny, I mean, growing up I was, I was bullied, so it's interesting to be hmm. playing the, the role reversal there. Do you Where find it was... Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, Zach, um, do you find that that was a hard role to play, coming from that angle? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, my character is very mean and, and sadistic, but mm. um, you never want to you never want to play that. Um, you always want to play the opposite of it because if sure. you play if you play what it is, then it, it's it's not as interesting. Mm. Where can I see the movie? Is it going to be released? Yeah, it'll it'll be it'll be released. I think um, theatrically everywhere. It's not the editing's um, not done. We just did uh, some ADR on the film, audio dialogue replacement. Um, we had to go in and loop 
certain yes. scenes over again vocally. So. What's the name of the film so that we can look out for it? It's called Ice Cream. It's from the producers who did uh, American um, Psycho with oh, Christian okay. Bale and a bunch of okay. other creepy, huh. cool movies. Yeah. I'll have to keep an eye out. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Thank you, guys. I think I think it's like I, I want to just thank Billy and, and all of you guys for coming because it's connecting all of you t here together, showing all the example of people doing uh, positive change, trying to be examples, and whatever we're working on, that um, it's all like a little piece of a bigger puzzle. Totally. You know, we're we're, we're, we're meeting here. And, I'm not necessarily the great public speaker, but I can see that, <laughs> and and uh, really love the fact that you're all being examples of people who are choosing to make a difference and choosing to do what you can with the tools you have. And I suspect that you probably feel daunted often, that you you feel nervous and scared and intimidated, because I know I sure as heck do when I go and do stuff too. And yet you're being those examples, and I find that really, really, really encouraging, because uh, you know. The world can be really intimidating, but yeah. but having the example of all of you guys walking alongside really helps me out a lot. So thank you all. Aw, thank you, Jordan. I think that was very well said. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you're doing a lot too in the area of um, the entertainment industry to change uh, the world for good, especially in the lives of girls. And gosh. We need to hear about that if you can. And like, <laughs> really you know. quick, really quick yeah. before the musical guest. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I do what I do. You know, radio has been um, amazing to me in Canada, and I think the biggest thing is really just being an example. Uh, kind of goes along with what even Tara and Annette both do as well. But just having people respect women and women in the forefront of media. Um, my biggest thing is just being integral with what I do in my music, and that's that's pretty important to me right now as we're fighting all this, um, you know, human trafficking and slavery. It really just comes down to people's value and identity. And so I've kind of set out to do my career, um, taking the harder road for sure, because I've, I've turned down really, really big deals, but uh, trusting um, that there are more doors than there have been, uh, just to continue to open the uh, the doors to more platform to really just be able to share how we can be authentic and real and valuable, um, especially to our young women. So in the music industry and in the entertainment industry specifically. So, yeah, huge, so important. Yeah. I'm seeing all these threads connecting everything. That's what it goes on in my brain, and 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 I love the fact that looking at this, we talked about addressing poverty um, as a as a means to target uh, the slavery. It's also a means to target uh, drug abuse, and, and, and all of these things connect into that whole thing where Marika was talking about value and an identity, and how people see themselves, and how they see their see the people around them that leads into that, which leads into the yeah. and and all yeah. of these things, and it's it's all so connected, and yeah. Um, you know yeah, so being those examples and, and encouraging each other. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also I think it's also a matter of just being media literate, Jordan. Like our our the generations that are coming underneath us too are there's everyone is taught how to drive, taught how to eat, how to talk, but nobody teaches media literacy. And it it's actually one of the things that influences our world so much. And I think that's why I had a passion for the entertainment industry because when someone wants to raise money, you get all the artists together and all the celebrities and they raise like millions of dollars. And you know, when there's a political campaign going on or it's the artists are coming together to change it. And I think when you when you create an environment where people can actually understand the meaning of media and the reasons that it's out there, then you can create some really great change. Um, and then on the flip side, as you've, you, we've all been seeing, is there's a lot of negativity in the media. And it's not real, a lot of the entertainment. <laughs> it's, it's people acting, and it's people doing what they think is, is okay to do. But unfortunately, it's shaping the minds of everybody that is watching and listening. And uh, we, I just wanted to bring something different. Yeah, mm -hmm. like value. <laughs> yeah, value. It's about time to get yeah. to our musical guest, Anna Cron, and here is Tibby for the last time. I just wanted to be seen one more time. Now oh, you can go back. Bye, Tibby. <laughs> you can go back to sleep over here. But yeah, Anna Cron, have you uh, uh, test your audio or anything? Like, uh, you know how to turn on stream mode? I'm sorry, what was that? 
Do you, have, uh, do you know how to turn on studio mode? No, I don't. You know, I was trying to figure it out, um, but I swear every time I come on to Google Hangouts, it's different. <laughs> well, 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 you go to the gear icon on the upper okay. right. I've, I've got it. I've got it. I got it. All right. And then you switch from voice to studio, click save, yep. and then you're in studio mode. Yeah, yeah I'm sounds, good. It sounds uh, you just switched. And yes, I mute everybody else's feed. And is, it, uh, uh, is it good? Yeah, it sounds I think it's good. good. All right. So, <clears throat> in the uh, in the spirit of the uh, topics for today's show, I decided that I should do some serious songs. Uh, <clears throat> so, let me get into it. My name is Anacron. For those that I have not met, which is pretty much everyone in here right now, is for the except for Billy. So, how's it going, everybody? Although, Mr. Brownlee, I did watch one of your videos and share it with a bunch of my. Uh, friends that I was trying to convince to join Google Plus quite a while ago. So nice, nice to see you. you. I got to get your digital autograph or something like that. All what? right. <clears throat> so I'll start with this. <clears throat> and this is just uh, something that I wrote recently in the uh, in the way of responding to a lot of the quote unquote activism that I've seen happening. <clears throat> Do you want to make a difference? You ain't trying that hard. There's folks that need assistance right there in your backyard. Homeless, hungry, we got it right there with the injustice and inequity. Welcome to America. You ain't got to hit the internet to find it. These billion dollar social networks help define it. And I ain't got to say it twice or repeat, but ain't nobody eating off your stupid likes and retweets. Status update, preaching, post lengths. When it's time to donate, bank you like, no thanks. Can't drop a dollar just to help her build a classroom. But 99 cent resign quick on iTunes. Living with privilege, none of us are innocent. Helpless is the enemy and selfish is our nemesis. Fool so funny, acting like an activist. Talking with no action, this is what is known as acting, bitch. You understand what I'm saying? Let me keep it going. You stand no sabe. This is called Cover to America. Wave a hand or something if it sounds all right. It goes like this. Bad French. Hold on. That's kidding. Dedicated all my homies that are immigrants. Listen, it goes. She was a fine Spanish princess. Matter somewhere in between Venezia and Venice. She been blessed. A slimy with a beautiful face. Shapely waist, brains, and good taste. My gang was good lace. She liked that angle. But in the blink of an eye, our lives are tangled. Hours nicely wrangled. Miss not an instance. Incidents of distance, rinsed and inconsistent. But I wanted my cariño close. So she headed for the space to meet me on the west coast. Now that's true love. The type of dedication that was more than enough to cross the borders of a nation. Let's go. Give me your tired boy. Your huddle mass is yearning to breathe free. Never breathe and know it up. Spirit is barbed wire door. Young passes. It ain't easy. Come into America. Give me your tired boy. Your huddle mass is yearning to breathe free. Never breathe and know it up. Spirit is barbed wire door. And young passes. It ain't easy. Come into America. On the day of her arrival, I was liable to spread the word like the Bible. Hey, preach. My Latin European peach was a flight away in brighter days, but just beyond reach. At the main baggage claim, I could barely breathe in the throes of the rolls in my heart from my sleeve. LAX, I was in the airport. Then a text I wasn't prepared for. Hey, problema. Customs got her wrapped up. TSA is whack, cuz food don't make me act up. When she came down, I was glad that she made it after being strip search profiled and degraded. Tried to file a complaint. Oh, is that, that right? Patriotic act means a patriotic act, right? Y'all, more security. F Fuck the, the badge you're wearing, bruh. Giving visitors the worst. Welcome to America. Life gives you entire poor. Huddle masses. You need to breathe free. Never breathe in there with us. Liberty bar, wire door. Dumb passes. It ain't easy. Coming to America. Give me your tired poor. Huddle masses. You need to breathe free. Never breathe in there with us. Liberty bar, wire door. Dumb passes. It ain't easy. Coming to America. Land 
land of the free, home of the brave. I guess you're only welcome if you're coming as a slave. From the jump, she was treated like a criminal. Some of it was outright, other times a criminal. Even though she looked white, accent enunciation. Got her face in all types of discrimination. The silly cracker thought my Spanish girl was Mexican. Talking body with our country, never met a man. Damn fool, gotta get it clear, nerd. Spanish found America, Mexicans, Mexicans was here, here first. first, stupid. Yeah. And the governance on better church charge hella for a reason, but they won't let it work. Try to pop and play, my skin's brown. The man has a plan designed to keep you down. And if you doubt that self evident truth, hype is fake. Try to smuggle love into the United States. Give me your tired core, huddle masses, yearning to breathe free. Never breathing air with us, liberty, bar wire door. It ain't easy coming to America. Give me your tired border, huddle masses, yearning to breathe free. Never breathing air with us, liberty, bar wire door, never passes. It ain't easy coming to America. That's that one. That uh, music video is actually coming out real soon. Yay! Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Please, please, thank you. All right. <clears throat> so good. What's the time looking like? Okay, I got 10, I got 10 minutes, right? Yes. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the music was slightly loud, though. The music is? A little loud. It's slightly A loud. little loud, okay. I will turn the music down So. Good, though. It was good, yeah. Sweet. Thank you. That if, was uh, so dope. If oh, the yeah. music was loud and you guys missed the lyrics on that last one, you can uh, listen to it on my SoundCloud page, soundcloud.com slash anachron music. Go to my website to hear ten, tons of other music, anachronmusic.com is my website. Um, find me, of course, on Google+, Plus, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, all that fun social network stuff that everybody loves to do nowadays. Yeah. I've been doing music since far, since way before internet. <laughs> was a common thing. <laughs> My first record came out in 1994. And uh, back then, social networking basically was when you stood outside on the corner after the club ended and, <laughs> and told people to listen to your music and you gave them a cassette tape. Yeah, that's, I was going to say, cassette tape. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's when I started social networking. That's when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, all right, moving right along. So I wanted to do this uh, other acapella, and I'm trying to remember it right now. I'm actually stalling, and I can't remember how it starts. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Is this the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? All signs point to the time for repenting. The heavens opened up and they engaged in plagues because the underground religion been sinning. First, it was a plague of blood. Lil Wayne and them got fame and then became a blood, which seems a little strange because the hood know we not, but he got a gang of fans claiming blood. Keeping it fake is the new, keeping it real. Changing y'all more hip than hot plague of frogs. They forgot about the DJ. They deserve a lashing. A little vague advice and plague of life, so get them scratching. What? Go up with the herd, it's a plague of wild animals Biting off the next man, self-consumed cannibals I'm betting this plague of pestilence is finna dead in kids Like a record label's annual recruitment report Soup's finna stored, boil like the next plague Best protect your fresh fade, ought to be keeping the mouth closed Thinking about when the clouds go open with the seventh plague Hell from above, by now the platinum will leap Begin to notice and started to lose focus Even some of the wannabe underground locals All they wanted was buzz, so they got a plague of locusts Then the darkness comes when the little guy Blocks a bigger guy like an eclipse of the sun Busters rip and they run Never once assuming they could have avoided this when it begun. But it's too late to take it back now. Whack house. Suck up for so hard for every verse scorn. But you say your lyrics are your brainchild. So your tenth plague's been made to kill your firstborn. And I'm gonna end it with this one.
sunshine rolled up on my face And I couldn't move from where I lay Where I lay And when I spoke up, my words were true And my soul just came pouring That's it. Y usted no sabe lo que... This song was awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks. It's always a little tricky to do uh, via Hangouts because I only got one mic here and I got to do the... Yeah, up the and up and down. down. But it, was, it, was, yeah. it came across really well. It was, Thank uh, you. I think that's the first time I've heard Sax in a Hangout. So good. good. It was good. It was right good. on. Thanks, guys. That was a my lot better live. Drink sacks in a hangout too. Right Are you on. gonna come to Vancouver and play? Um, you know, I haven't been to Canada for quite a while, and <laughs> oh, I would love to get. Stop yeah, I, I actually I love I love Canada so much, and I really do need to get back up there sometime soon. Um, I've got uh, some some stuff coming out with a producer from Canada, so I'm sure that once that drops, I'll be. Up that well, way. Cool. On the I probably know him. Promotional tour. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a guy named Aries. Uh, Aries is his uh, production name. I'm not sure. I don't even know what his real name is. But you know, that's what we do in the world of uh, hip hop. We don't. We don't. We don't learn each other's names. <laughs> is that yeah. on your SoundCloud? Unless you're like me and you just use your real name, then everybody knows your name, and it's like you know. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the yeah, only I mean, guy. I, like I don't. I don't ever, <laughs> I don't know everybody's like fake names. <laughs> right. Right, right. It's funny because people are always like, oh, hey, do you know, uh, this, this guy said he knows you. His name is James. I'm like, what? James? I, I don't think I know a James. But it's probably some dude James that I talk Canada, to all the time. James, What's up? James from Canada? I know James from Canada. Yeah. Oh, see? <laughs> see? Yeah. <laughs> Was that song uh, available on your SoundCloud before we end here? Uh, the, the last one I just did? Yeah. No. No, it is not. That's actually uh, that was actually on a, um, a limited tour release that I did. Uh, it was like a CD that I pressed up for uh, a tour that I did overseas, and um, the CD was um, a compilation of songs that I had written and recorded with my quartet. So they were actually more. It was more jazz stuff, and then that song, which is kind of a, I don't really know how to classify that song, but uh, a couple other songs, similar, awesome. a couple of instrumental tunes. Uh, you know, yeah, let's classify so, it great. Yeah. So oh, if that's we want to rare. get that into our ears, we just have to be watching this YouTube recording over and over again. Now. Right on, right on, right you on. Should I'm sure I'll, I'll probably re-release that soon as a digital download thing. But uh, you know, that's uh, that stuff that the material from that CD and from that I've done with the quartet is all stuff that I usually tend to do in my live concerts. And I perform live a lot, usually like four times a month minimum. I travel a lot, I tour a lot, um, so I do shows uh, locally around like the LA area. Um, I produce a concert series that I always perform out, of course, and then I always get booked around L.A. I get booked around the country on a regular basis, and then I go overseas and out of the country frequently. So, so it, it's been a 
about an hour, and I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming, and it was great having all you guys. And um, next week uh, we'll be back, and uh, I'm going to be having a panel of photographers, and we'll be talking a bit about uh, licensing on, on photos and, and copyright. So I'd like to thank all you guys for joining all of the uh, viewers.